Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm Steve Karakis with the Nuclear Energy Institute, uh, and I'll introduce our panelists here in just a second. Uh, we're delighted that you could join us today for an announcement regarding uh, interim consolidated storage of used nuclear fuel. Uh, what I would like to do is remind you, everyone just that we don't, you know, we don't deal with uh, in store and all those things with used nuclear fuel, we don't do that just for the sake of having used nuclear fuel. It is a byproduct of something very important in our society, which is the reliable generation of about 20 percent of our nation's electricity, uh, far and away our leading source of carbon-free electricity. Uh, you know, they've got winter weather pounding them in New England again. You've got nuclear energy facilities up there that are really trying to, uh, helping to meet that load, and they do that wintertime, summertime, uh, literally year-round, almost 24-7. So uh, that's the value to our society. Use nuclear fuel as a byproduct of that process, but uh, just to help remind folks of that. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce our, our panel members who will, uh, three of whom at least, will have some uh, opening remarks briefly, and then we will turn it open to your questions. Uh, I would, uh, because we are, we do have phone lines open, so if you would please let me come around with a microphone uh, before you answer your question, ask your question, so that uh, we can make sure that those who are listening in can, uh, can do that and hear the question as well as the answer. So first we've got uh, uh, Beverly Marshall, uh, M-A-R-S-H-A-L-L. -L. Beverly's a senior director for federal programs with NEI. Uh, to her left is uh, Bill Lindquist, L-I-N-D-Q-U-I-S-T. Bill is the Chief Executive Officer for Waste Control Specialists. To his left, Rod Baltzer, B-A-L-T-Z-E-R. Rod is President of Waste Control Specialists. Then last but not least, we've got Michael McMahon, M-C, capital M-A-H-O-N. Mike is Senior Vice President. Arriva TN Americas. Arriva is a participant in this pro project. Um, and then I'd also, uh, it's interesting, you know, for those of you, if you didn't see today's editorial in the Washington Post, uh, back to Yucca Mountain, uh, there is language in here toward the end. In the world we have, however, Nevadans are entrenched in opposition, and the Obama administration is determined to put a long-term storage facility only in a place that would welcome it. And that's part of the answer we get today is a facility that does want this material. Uh, I would also note uh, for those uh, either here in our audience or on the phone, uh, we, there's also a statement that's, gonna, that's in the press kits that are uh, available today from Congressman Mike Conaway of the 11th District of Texas. Uh, we're happy to provide that to you. Just uh, You could send me an email directly after the fact, if need be, sck at nei.org, and we'll get you uh, that statement if you need it. Uh, with that, I'll turn the floor open to Beverly. Thank you, Steve. I'm going to join Steve today in saying welcome and thank you for joining us. I want to take a few minutes and provide some background and context for Waste Control Specialist's announcement regarding the company's interest in hosting an interim consolidated storage facility. As Steve mentioned, commercial used nuclear fuel is a byproduct of electricity generation from carbon-free nuclear energy. Nuclear energy generates approximately 20 percent of the electricity and almost two-thirds of the carbon-free electricity across America. The Nuclear Waste Policy Act established the Nuclear Waste Fund and the Nuclear Waste Fee by which the industry pays for the disposal of used nuclear fuel. The Nuclear Waste Fund has a balance of more than $30 billion and earns interest of more than a billion dollars a year. The Nuclear Waste Policy Act also required the Department of Energy to begin accepting used fuel from commercial nuclear facilities in 1998. Of course, DOE missed that date, and energy companies have been suing the department to recover damages for this breach of contract. These damages are paid from the taxpayer-funded judgment fund. DOE estimates the total liability for the federal government at about $27 billion, including $4.5 billion already paid to these companies. This estimate assumes that the department begins accepting used nuclear fuel in 2021. 
the industry is committed to restarting a sustainable federal program. To this end, we are advocating the completion of the Yucca Mountain Repository, the establishment of a new management entity dedicated to solely executing a high-level radioactive waste disposal program and empowered with the authority and resources to succeed, funding reform to provide access to the Nuclear Waste Fund for its intended purpose, and establishing an interim consolidated storage facility in a willing host community and state. It is industry's view that consent-based consolidated storage is the quickest route for the federal government to begin moving commercial used nuclear fuel and to begin reducing the taxpayers' liabilities. Interim consolidated storage is not the complete solution, but it is a prudent investment while continuing to pursue geologic disposal. It would complement the repository program and provide a contingency in case the repository program continues to suffer significant delay. Because the technology is proven, the industry is confident that an interim consolidated storage facility can be operational in 10 years, if not sooner, in a willing community and state. The industry supports the efforts of waste control specialists and other communities and states as they demonstrate their interest in hosting nuclear fuel storage facilities. Today's announcement is a significant development and could enable the federal government to meet its statutory obligation and begin moving used fuel before a repository is open. We urge Congress to authorize and fund DOE to implement an interim consolidated storage program to explore the unique opportunity that the WCS project or future projects may present. Energy companies, their local communities and states, and American taxpayers deserve a federal program that will meet its obligation to safely and securely take title to, transport, store, and ultimately dispose of used nuclear fuel and high-level radioactive waste. Until that time, the industry will continue to manage used nuclear fuel safely and securely. At the same time, we will work with Congress to restart a sustainable program that will meet the Energy Department's obligations and reduce taxpayer liability as quickly as possible. I now welcome Bill Lindquist from Waste Control Specialists to discuss the Andrews County Project and the opportunity it presents for their community, for Texas, and for our whole country. Uh, thank you, Beverly. I also want to thank you for being here as well, and I want to thank uh, NEI for hosting, as well as uh, the National Press Club. On Friday, Waste Control Specialists filed a letter of intent with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission informing the Commission of our intent to seek a license to operate a used fuel storage facility at our Andrews, Texas County facility. We intend to work with Arriva, a global leader in used nuclear fuel management and transportation, to help us provide a safe and comprehensive solution for this material, which has been accumulating at utility sites and for which our nation has been struggling to develop a comprehensive management system. We are serious and committed to this project. I fully intend to have a formal license submitted in a little over a year by April of 2016. We believe the NRC can issue an interim storage license by the summer of 2019, and we can be begin construction immediately and be in a position to begin accepting fuel, uh, used fuel for storage by the end of 2020. This will be a community-supported, consent-based facility, just as our current nuclear facilities are. The community and the region have already been apprised of the proposal. Andrew County has passed a unanimous resolution of support, and Texas elected officials have been well briefed on our plans, and we will continue to update, update them as the process moves along. While this is obviously a federal license we are seeking, we're well aware that we must keep the state, local, and regional authorities informed, engaged, and supportive. We've been doing exactly that for the last 20 years, and this effort will be no different. We are asking for a federal license and not a federal handout. WCS will not seek any federal or state funding for either licensing or constructing the used fuel storage facility. Before I ask WCS President Rod Baltzer to come up and give you some more details about our current operations and our plans for the interim storage, I would like to close on this note. 
Some of you will scoff at our timeline. You'll say that the, we've been wrestling with this issue for 40 years, and here comes a small Texas company saying they expect to begin solving this problem in just five years from today, and that's not possible. Well, I beg to differ. History would say that we can do this. Since early in the 1980s, when Congress was initially addressing the issue of handling the back end of the nuclear fuel cycle, I know of only one community that actively embraced the challenge, one community that worked in unison with the confidence to say this can be done safely and securely. That community is Andrews, Texas. There's been exactly one state that has fulfilled the mandate of the Low Level Radioactive Waste Policy Act passed by Congress in 1980. One state has successfully cited, built, and is now operating a low-level radioactive waste facility. That one state is Texas. And there's been only one company that has made more than a half a billion dollar investment to license, construct, and operate a nuclear waste facility, and that is waste control specialists. We know how to do this. We know the key is open and honest communication with the community, the state, and now the federal government. That dialogue is well underway and as of today, it begins in Washington. Rod, why don't you come up here and give some additional information. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. I want to begin by echoing one thing that Bill already said. This will be a community-supported, consent-based facility. We appreciate the Blue Ribbon Committee introducing the term in the used fuel debate here in Washington but we've been doing everything related to our site in Texas on a consent basis for a long, long time. And as we are well aware, it is the only way a facility like this can exist. WCS currently operates two licensed disposal facilities, the Texas Compact Facility and the Federal Waste Facility on a 14,000 acre site in West Texas. We have the ideal location, an experienced workforce, an impeccable safety record, and a community that understands and supports this industry. Our facilities are situated in an arid, isolated part of the state. Because we've already gone through a five-year licensing process to obtain our low-level disposal licenses, we offer one of the most geologically studied areas in the country. We're the only privately owned and operated facility in the United States that can treat, store, and dispose of Class A, B, and C low-level radioactive waste. We may need legislative changes or policy clarifications to ensure that an interim storage facility will fit seamlessly into a, a national program of used fuel management. We believe our interim storage proposal will provide an intermediate solution to a national problem and a commitment of good faith to the nuclear utilities and the American people. Construction of the used fuel storage facility will begin once legislative changes or policy clarifications are made and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has issued a license. Used fuel has been safely transported across the United States since 1965. More than 2,700 shipments have traveled more than 1.6 million miles. WCS will work with Areva, a global industry leader who is highly experienced in the handling and transportation of used fuel worldwide. The primary operations performed at the used fuel storage facility will be transferring the used fuel contained, safely contained in a steel canister from a transportation cask into an interim fuel storage system. The used fuel will not be removed from the permanent cask, which is a thick welded steel cylinder. The entire transfer process has been proven to be safe. The state of Texas maintains extensive active oversight of our facility through the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality which monitors everything we do at our Andrews facility, and we expect that to continue as this process moves forward. We will be keeping the community and the public updated and informed as this process continues. To that end, we have launched an informational website, wcsstorage.com. We plan to utilize that and other media initiatives to keep the public engaged throughout this licensing process. We have learned from experience that maintaining open communications is a must if you are going to maintain the public trust. WCS is committed to providing an interim storage solution for the country. Under the most optimistic scenario, the United States is still decades away from having a permanent repository for this fuel. We already have several shutdown nuclear power plants 
scattered across the country, each with used fuel stored on site in dry fuel storage systems. And more will be decommissioned in the future, leaving the used fuel stranded at individual sites. Until the debate over a disposal repository is resolved and the years necessary to license and construct that facility is completed, our nation needs a safe, centralized interim storage solution. We believe Andrews, Texas, and WCS provide that solution. Thank you. We'll open up to questions. Again, please, uh, if you would, just wait for the microphone. Hi, Daniel Bloom from CQ Roll Call. A uh, question for either Bill or Rod. Um, so you've mentioned the consent-based process that was part of the BRC recommendation on America's uh, nuclear future in 2012. Have you guys held public hearings yet in Andrews County uh, to engage the public on, on this decision? And uh, also, uh, who will your customers be moving forward? I assume the two nuclear plants are already operating in Texas, but uh, who else are you guys envisioning will take part in? Uh, agreements to have you guys store the waste? We'll, we'll figure out how we split the answers to this. We'll probably both answer both of all of them, I would guess. Uh, on the public process, we had a, uh, we had a uh, all community meeting in the, uh, in the early part of December. We had uh, 500 people attend out of a town of about 13,000 on a cold, wintry Monday night. We always figure that if you serve a barbecue dinner, you get a lot more people there, and that's what we did. Um, so that we had that meeting. Uh, a lot of positive comments, a lot of, a lot of questions. Um, and what, what we have said to the community is that there's, they're still learning about this whole process. And uh, when the NRC uh, it take, uh, it takes the, the license initiative, uh, there'll be several more public comment periods. I mean, cup, I'm sorry, public meetings out in Andrews that they'll be able to attend as well. So they're well aware of what the process is going to be, and they understand that they're going to have a... Uh, a formalized process for them to comment on the license as well. Yeah, I just add to that that uh, that that resulted in Andrews County issuing a county resolution, and uh, the, a copy of that resolution should be in your press packet as well. As far as customers, uh, the Department of Energy is responsible for used fuel, and so they would actually take title to this as it leaves the nuclear power plants, and would be our customer for storage of that material as well. Hi, Google Arts with Argus Media. Uh, what is the cost of uh, building uh, the facility you propose, and uh, how much can you store there on an interim basis? So we're still obviously very early on in the process. It depends what the license conditions are and, and what we're required to do as we go through the Nuclear Regulatory Commission process. Uh, so that cost and of, of exactly what that'll cost uh, is, is still a little undetermined. Um, but uh, we, we think that is a challenge we can meet, and uh, that's why we also have put in the placeholder that we need to have uh, either legislative changes or policy clarifications to make sure a company like ours could get paid for this, uh, for storing the material, as well as have a license in hand to make sure construction of a facility like that is, is worthwhile. Yeah, as, as Rod mentioned in his opening comments, you know, when we uh, get further along, um, we will, if, if, we can't, if we can't get, um, you know, when we get to the point of deciding whether to do construction or not, we'll look to see what has happened in terms of funding the, uh, funding the proposal, funding the interim storage. The other thing is, is uh, the, the, the um, site will be built out in phases. So we'll start with a 100, 100 acre facility and then it would have the ability to grow from there. We've got, we're on 14,000 acres. We've got plenty of land to be able to uh, build a facility. Not that we'd use all 14,000 acres, but I say that as a means of buffer, and we've got plenty of land to be able to expand and, and, and add to the capacity if we need to. Thank you, Elaine Hiruo Platts. Um, part of DOE's strategy has included two storage facilities, a pilot for fuel from shutdown reactors and a larger consolidated. Are you going into this with a plan for one or the other, or, or is it going to be open to everyone? And a second question, how far can you get in the process without congressional action to pass new waste legislation? Um, who wants to take the first one? I'll take the second. 
So as far as uh, fuel, yeah, we, we envision that this would be both spent nuclear fuel from nuclear utilities as well as high-level waste from the Department of Energy. Well, I'm sorry. I was, was that the question? Well, <laughs> well the, and, the, and the closed? Yeah, I, I think, you know, how, how we did the, the low-level facility in Texas was we started with uh, Texas waste first. Um, it, you know, it, it helps with the communities and the, and the state to say that you're going to deal with their waste first. So I think to the extent that it is uh, uh, ready and available to ship, we would look at the two Texas facilities first. But after that, I think the plan uh, would be to go for the plants that are, that are no longer operational. So we can get the, that waste and, and have the, uh, the land returned back to the communities where they're, where they're uh, sited. On the, on, the, uh, on the second question, your question presupposes that we have to have legislation. Um, I'm not a lawyer, but I think what your question is, is, is DOE, if we don't have legislation, the question is, is DOE able under the, uh, under the rulings in the court where they have now an obligation and they're incurring penalties, do they have the ability to fulfill that obligation by taking title to the waste and then shipping it to WCS or to some other, or some other interim facility under the Nuclear Waste Policy Act? I don't know the answer to that. But that's, that's, what the, that's what your question presupposes. I think there is an interpretation out there that says DOE can, can do that, that they can enter into a con contractual obligation to, relieve their, to perform their duties and relieve their obligation. But as I said, I'm not a lawyer, so um, I, I don't, I didn't want you to go down the road to necessarily say that it has, there has to be legislation. Thank you. Um, Michael Lindenberger with the Dallas Morning News. Can you give us just a little bit more detail about what you expect the project to cost, uh, some range in terms of what your construction would be? And then ultimately, I mean, are we talking about, you know, hundreds and hundreds or thousands of acres of these facilities if it builds out in your most optimistic hopes or, you know, one or two hundred acres? Well, we appreciate our local newspaper being here. <laughs> Why don't you go ahead? Yeah, I'll, I'll point to this chart on my left, and you can see a, a blue shaded area. That's uh, phase one. We, we've basically set aside approximately 1,000 acres. Uh, we think this will be in multiple phases. Uh, this phase one is just a small portion of that, and that would be for the first uh, 10,000 or so metric tons, which should accommodate the permanently shut down uh, reactors plus Texas. Um, and so it would be built out in phases. As you look at, uh, you know, the uh, uh, president's budget just came out. Uh, they've apportioned, I think, $5.7 billion, but it includes interim storage, transportation, some significant work on a repository and, and other things in there. Um, building this is, is basically like you would at a nuclear power plant. This is how the, store, the fuel is stored currently. So it's a pad, it's storage modules, it's the uh, mechanisms to lift that off a transportation canister and move that into the storage mechanisms, security, and things like that. Um, so uh, unknown exactly what that cost is, as you look at some of the uh, reports and other things out there, it's, it's millions of dollars, but not billions of dollars. Jeremy Dillon, Rad Waste Monitor. Uh, how involved is DOE in the funding of it? Are they involved at all, or uh, and how involved are they in kind of the planning of, of things moving forward? Well, I think I think DOE is aware of what we're doing. Have we had formal conversations with them? No, we we haven't, and we look forward, uh, I think, pretty soon to uh, to doing that. Um, how involved will DOE be? It's their obligation. I mean, they're the one, they're going to be our customer. They're the ones that has to ship the waste. Um, they're the ones that uh, WCS, as well as the state, will have to negotiate with as to what the economics of it are. So I think in terms of involvement and importance, obviously a DOE ranks at the, at the top of that. But we have not had any formal discussions with anyone in the administration, but I think we're gonna, we'll, we'll, we'll do that relatively soon. Uh, thank you. Steve Tatro with the Las Vegas Review Journal. Can you talk about what the role of the county and the state would be or will be on this moving forward? Are, are they the entities that'll have to uh, sign agreements with DOE to, to agree to host uh, this site and this material? And has there been any discussion locally of the benefits that might accrue to the state or the community for agreeing to do this? 
Well, uh, l this is going to be a long answer because I get even background. So we operate a low-level radioactive waste facility. And currently, um, for what we call out-of-compact waste, which is non-Texas Vermont waste so f from 34 other states, uh, the state of Texas gets 25 percent of our gross revenue and the county gets 5 percent of our gross revenue. Last year, for the county, that represented about uh, three, three and a half million dollars. It looks like it's going to be about a million dollars a quarter. Out of a 14, 15 million dollar budget, big deal. Um, so I think they already understand what the potential economics are. They're well versed because we have it in, in what we're doing now. Um, in terms of the county, the, uh, the agreement with the county, the, the, uh, what, the, what they issued says that the county judge will be responsible for negotiating whatever economics they, they, they get from this. So the county judge obviously will be involved. But I envision that being a, a, um, um, an overarching negotiation with the county judge, the state, and WCS to see what, what, what DOE has in mind, and we have to have those discussions as well. Um, I think once we, uh, we, we, don't, we don't expect a whole lot of involvement right now with the state of Texas and the leadership of the state of Texas because there's really nothing to sign off on. Um, what, what we had to do for our low-level facility is we applied for a license and it took a five-year period. So we had to convince the state that we could do this safely and we could, and we could do it protective of the environment and our employees as well. And once we did that, they issued the license. We then went into the legislature for two sessions in 11 and 13, and they expanded that license on what type of waste because they felt comfortable in the, the ability to, that we could, we could do it safely. So I think this will go the same way. I think once we, once we uh, go through the NRC, prove to the NRC that we can do it safely, prove that we can do it, and we can do it in a timely fashion, and then and then have conversations with DOE to see what the economics of the deal are, then it goes back to the state. And the state has this bundle that says, okay, you've convinced us you can do it safely. Are the benefits worth it to the state and the county for us to move this along? And that'll happen in either the 2017 legislature or the 2019 legislature. But it's the same process that we went through for low level, and I think it's gonna be the same process here. I'm sorry for the long answer. Jeff Beatty with the yeah. Energy Daily. <clears throat> what specifically, I have two questions also, what specifically would you need from the legislature at that point? And then secondly, how are you answering concerns that, you know, which you obviously want to be an interim solution, would in practice turn out to be permanent? As you know, nuclear waste tends to, you know, go to one location and stay there for a very long period of time. I can't imagine that happening. Um, I'll answer the second one first. You wrote down the first one. Legislation. Yeah. Um, on the second one, uh, that question came up. You know, I said we had a, a public meeting in Andrews. That question came up. And interim storage, as you know, is defined for some period greater than 60 years. And for most of us, we're not going to see that end of that period if it goes for the maximum period. Um, all you can do, all we, what we did, what we will do, and have started to do, is just educate, talk about Yucca Mountain, talk about other repositories, and uh, and see where it goes. Um, for, you know, as you said, 60 years seems like a lot, long time for a lot of people, but I think it's just through education, and um, I think everyone believes that it needs to be in a permanent uh, deep ge geological repository, which we're not offering. We're just offering storing it above ground. Um, yeah. So for your first question, uh, what kind of legislation, if any, would be needed in Texas? Um, I, I, we're not sure any legislation is actually needed, particularly at this point. When it comes to uh, what the state of Texas expects as a hosting fee or things like that, uh, typically that has gone through legislation in Texas uh, and, and goes through that process to get approved. Uh, it doesn't have to happen that way, but that's typically what we've seen. You know, uh, and the economics, um, Rod mentioned a hosting fee, and that's been, you know, there's a lot of people have speculated what, what the format would be. What we do on the low level, as I said, is, is the state shares in our revenue. And we find that to be, other than being very expensive, um, it, we find that to be very a positive way to go because it creates a partnership between us and the state of Texas. And they're, motiv you know, they're motivated to, for us to succeed because they are getting a percentage of our revenues as well. And I would, I would hope and envision that we can create the same thing here as well. Someone who hasn't had a chance to ask a question. Uh, 
Brian DeRigo, Nuclear Monitor. Uh, well, I, I just wanted to ask one question. What is it? Um, one more quick question. Uh, have you heard anything from legislators yet about your proposal, uh, whether or not uh, any of the legislators that sign on to the Nuclear Waste Administration Act of 2013 have come out in support of it, uh, whether they've contacted you at all, uh, any sort of consultation with uh, that proposal? I, 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 don't, I don't know if we've talked to them about that proposal. I'd have to talk to the people here in D.C. We have talked uh, we have talked to all the Texas delegation about what our plans are. We've talked to some of the key leaders in Congress about what our plans are. Uh, but in terms of how what we're doing fits into the overall administration's management of fuel, I, I'm, I'm not aware of it. Elaine Hiruo Platts, you had mentioned you intend to file the application in 2017. 16. 16, pardon me. Could you um, kind of walk us through what work yet has to be done, any further site characterization, um, design at the facility, capacity, things of that nature? Thank you. Can I take this if you want? No, I'd like to take some of them. OK. Um, so uh, I, I noticed in NEI's co uh, comments that they said 10 years to site a facility. It's interesting that we follow up with five years. Um, the reason being is I think everyone looks at the 10 years. Uh, I think OAB came up with 10 years as well. Uh, the reason is is you're, I think the assumption is just a, it's just a, a site. You, know, you get a piece of property, and you've got to go through characterization. You've got to go through uh, the, the, um, uh, the storage systems. You've got to go through, you know, you've got to do all of your communication and all that as well. We spent five years getting a license and characterizing that property. We say in a lot of our releases that we have the most characterized piece of property on the face of the earth. We have, we've done 600 borings. We've done, we have 400 monitoring wells. We know exactly what is underneath and in that ground below us. And it's just a lot of clay, red, red bed clay, 600 feet of it. So I think, um, I think we will we'll have to update that environmental study, obviously. Uh, there could well be some different standards for the federal versus the state. But you know, we, have, we spent over $100 million doing that characterization uh, during that five-year period. So I don't expect, uh, when, when, you hit, when you try to reconcile between the five years and the 10 years, I think that's a large piece of it. Because uh, I think we have a, a head start, on, a dramatic head start on that as well. In terms of the, and then uh, the, the idea of working with Arriva and uh, the ability maybe to use their license for uh, licensing the, uh, the interim storage, uh, uh, the, the, the systems and the canisters and all that, there's the license that already exists for that because they have licenses for already on-site storage. Um, so that would be a, a benefit if we end up, if we do formalize our agreement and, and, and use them as a partner as well. The process will be, I think we'll, uh, we're, already, we're, in the, we're already in the middle of preparing the license. Um, and we'll have, a, we'll have a preliminary meeting with NRC, I would imagine, pretty shortly. And then uh, probably another couple of meetings before we actually file the license to make sure, application to make sure that we're on board with, with what both of us expect to produce. Do you have the ballpark figure on the total storage capacity of the facility? You, you mentioned it'll be done in stages. We haven't, um, and, and you know, it, 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 the transportation obviously plays a key in it as well. Is how quickly can you can you ship and get and get things in? As Rod said, it's 10,000 10, cubic feet for phase one. For phase for one, metric tons. Metric tons. I'm sorry, um, and um, we believe that's enough to deal with it, whatever Texas plants can ship and the uh, and the and the facilities that are shut down. We will also note uh, on my right, we've got a timeline, and that shows uh, how we developed our low-level application and kind of where we got to this point. And the bottom part of that is uh, going from the submittal of the license uh, through opening. Uh, if you take a closer look at that, that's also in your press package. And for everybody on the phone who can't see these, these are also in your press packages, and you can go online uh, to WCS Storage, WCS, S-T-O-R-H, 
uh, com and, uh, and download the press package that's here in the room today. Jeremy Dillon, Radways Monitor. Uh, I know, so commercial spent nuclear fuel has kind of been the, the main focus, but is DOE high-level waste uh, part of the plan to accept that at the facility? And, and if so, are they going to be stored on the same pad, or is there going to be kind of some, some distinction between the two? Uh, we will file an application that would be uh, uh, for, for either. Our, our focus is on the uh, permanently shut down plants in Texas at this point. Uh, but as those discussions happen with DOE, uh, you know, we'll, we'll find out if there's an interest there and, and uh, how that uh, impacts this plan as well. I'm sorry, uh, your focus is only on the plants in Texas or the plants in Texas plus all the decommissioned plants? Close. Yeah. Annalee An An Grant, SNL Energy. Um, can you tell me a bit about the physical makeup of the facility, the security that will be there, and at what point in the storage process will fuel actually be sent to this facility? Yeah, so, so the uh, low-level facilities right now do not have the storage and, and things, or, sorry, the security and things that we will have for the high-level uh, facility. Uh, for the high-level facility, it'll be similar to a nuclear power plant. Uh, uh, independent spent fuel storage facility installation, um, and it'll have 24/7 uh, guards, cameras, uh, other other items to secure that fuel. Uh, ours will have the same uh, processes and systems in place. And and so as you look at our timeline, uh, after we get our license, we would have approximately a year or so to construct the facility, uh, and then we'd be able to start taking fuel at the end of 2020, according to our timeline. Jeff Beatty with Energy Daily. I want to ask Mr. McMahon if you could elaborate a little bit more on Ariva's role and specifically what the license, the existing license is that you have that would be used as part of this process. Sure, so our role is, as uh, Rod said, is to support the license application for the initial facility. Um, what we're doing is taking our already licensed systems uh, that now currently ha uh, house used nuclear fuel and um, uh, uh, provide them to WCS to make the complete package. So they're bringing the site that's well characterized. We're bringing the already licensed system. So it should be a very straightforward process uh, to bring those two together and to get the licensing uh, document in really quickly. And, and again, the site's well characterized and the systems already hold fuel. There are not a lot of uncertainties out there and we see a very straightforward process going forward. then that raises a question. Does this mean that the fuel would have to be packaged in the Areva packages that, that would be covered in, under the license before it leaves the reactor site and is shipped to uh, a storage facility? I think we would envision um, that whoever is engaged to build the storage facility on our site could accept all of the different packages, whether it's NAC or whether it's Holtec, or whether it's Ariva. Thank you, Steve Tatro again, the Las Vegas Review Journal. I'm trying to picture what this is going to look like. Is this going to be row upon row of, of dry casks, or is it more complicated? Uh, no, you're right. It's uh, row upon row of dry casks, and there is a graphic in your press package and, and online at wcsstorage.com. Uh, but, but basically, it'll look just like you would see them at nuclear power plants today, uh, just on a larger scale, because we would consolidate many of those independent ones into one consolidated system. Seeing no other hands, uh, let, let, thank you all for... Let, let, let me I'm make sorry. one more statement. I'm sorry, because I promised... Tim Smith, that I, I would get this out, because I don't think it's been said, because we haven't had to answer the question. Why we're so confident we can do this is, in, as I said, when I went back to the low-level facility, that law was, low level, the low-level uh, law was passed in 1980. And from 1980 to 2005, 25 years, there were 10 attempts to site a low-level facility around the country with about a billion dollars spent. They were all state-controlled, non-consent based. Every one of them failed. In 2005, we came along as a private enterprise and tried to do the same thing. 
we were the only one, as we said, the first one to be successful. I just draw the parallels to what we're doing here with the spent fuel as well. This has been tried by the, by the federal government, and what we're offering is a private enterprise outside the Beltway trying to provide an innovative way to solve the problem that's escaped this country for decades. Thank you very much for coming. Appreciate it.